Good day, everyone. Um, my name is Rahul. I'm an emergency physician at Changi General Hospital. I'm also a flight physician and uh, I do some retrieval medicine from time to time, as well as disaster medicine. You're probably wondering why I'm doing ECGs. Well, the good thing about uh, flight physicians is that we can point you in the right direction. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to point you in the ways of the gurus. And there's a couple of gurus that I'll mention down the line. First things first, though. I do own a couple of shares of Sanofi, so if I mention anything by them, just promptly ignore me. The next thing to remember is that whenever you hear stuff, make sure you do your own research, read widely, and it's about applying your experience as well as the evidence that you've read, and in the context of the patient and what they want and what their values are. So don't just hear something and apply it immediately. A combination of all these things is what true evidence-based medicine is about. So complex ECGs um, are faced by everybody, including myself every day. And we need to know a little bit about the history of why we use ECGs to dichotomize. And then we'll go on to the, the new process, which you may find interesting. So Q-wave MIs and non-Q-wave MIs were the way we defined problems in the 80s and 90s. But when new research came out later in the 90s and somewhere near the 2000 era, whereby large trials, about 50 or 60,000 people showed that certain things were good. Aspen was good, reperfusion early was good, and geography was very good, even better than fibrinolytics. So STEMI and non-STEMI became the new paradigm. And there was a more refined way of figuring out who needed to go to the cath lab. Now this has gone undergone lots more refinement and we're in the fourth iteration of what we call a universal definition of MI. So the first one started in 2000 and we're up to the fourth one. Most of my references will be down on the lower right-hand segment. Um, and if you're studying for exams, you probably want to know what SD elevation really is and where to apply it. So figure one or arrow one points to the beginning of the Q wave and arrow two points to the J point where the SD segment is skewed. The difference between these two is elevation and that's what you're looking for. So once again, if you're studying for exams, and we're trying to cater to everybody here. So if you're studying for exams, these are the things that you need to know hospital criteria for activation for lytics or PCI all around the world has variances. So don't forget age, sex, and where these leads are all do matter. So it's different depending on who you are and where these elevations are. So remember that. But is that it? Is it pretty simple? That's all about it for MIs? Not quite. This does represent a problem, but what about this ECG? Can you apply all the criteria here? Is there two millimeter elevations? Is there one millimeter elevation? Does this patient go to the cath lab? Is there an occlusion problem? And you will hear me use the word occlusion more and more as we go along, because not everything is about STEMIs. So this was an ECG handed by pre-hospital physicians. Um, it was given to me actually by an ambulance crew and it was a patient which had an outcome which we'll discuss later. But would you send this to the cath lab? Now you're already suspecting something because this ECG is up there and you're biased. Some of you may notice that there's marked depressions here some of you may notice other things like inversions here and here. One could argue that there are elevations here and here. But what does this mean? Does this patient have something that needs emergent reperfusion? It's not that simple, is it? Because not everything is a STEMI. And do only STEMIs matter? Do only STEMIs go to the cath lab? Most of you are somewhat experienced in EM. And you know the answer to that is no, because there might be people who are hemodynamically compromised or electrically compromised, maybe undergoing an arrhythmia. So not only STEMIs matter, but is there a missed critical lesion rate? 
and it is, according to some studies, 25 to 30 percent. So ECGs, which don't fit the criteria, but have a critical lesion. And sometimes you might find yourself calling things STEMI equivalents. Some of us might use troponins, some don't. Some would call the interventionist and say there's an impending MI. Some would use troponin, some would use echoes in combination to call it subtle STEMIs. Well, I have somebody here who's got a one millimeter segment elevation. It's not really two, but would you take him to the cat lab, please? So we find ourselves trying to substitute what we really need to call a term for occlusion, because this doesn't fit any of those criteria. Now, if this was a uh, interactive lecture, we'd have a show of hands, but times are different. And sometimes we need our eyes open too. So I had my eyes opened when I was training and I was thinking after looking up an ECG that there must be something more to this. And listening to Amal Matu, who is one of the gurus, please check out his podcast and website. He's an extremely good emergency physician with a special interest in ECGs. He's published plenty of books, most of which I use during studying for exams myself. And I had my eyes open to another world when I applied one of these concepts that he made into real life. So this was a, one of our patients, which we had in Changi, and this is a really long time ago. It's still called EH Alliance back then, it's about seven or eight years ago. And some of you may recognize this. So it's pattern recognition in the end, just like you have pattern recognition for STEMIs. What you may notice in this ECG, some of you are probably familiar with it, uh, is that there's an impending problem, or there is an existing problem which will give an impending issue. I'll show you an even better one, and that's from another blog which you should check out, and that's Dr. Smith's ECG blog. Most of my references are from this blog. And this is a better ECG or a better example of what we're talking about from the prior ECG. Both ECGs were taken from a patient who had chest pain the day before. So no chest pain now, but chest pain the day before. What are you going to do? Difficult in a non-interactive lecture. No show of hands here, but how many of you would send this to a ward? Some of you might even send this home. But there are some changes. And I'm pretty sure most of you would identify these T waves as not being normal. This one definitely not being normal. And some of you might identify the T wave inversions here in the high lateral leads to be slightly abnormal. But how abnormal and what's the significance? Well, the answer is that biphasic T waves and deep T wave inversions, i.e. type one and type two are part of Wellen syndrome, which indicates proximal LAD obstruction. And that requires reperfusion via the cath lab. Aspirin and antiplatelets don't work for this. Medical therapy is futile and only opening up that obstruction works in Wellen syndrome. So sending this home will end up being the coroner's outpatient clinic and uh, you don't want to do that. So remember this pattern because it's not all about pure SD elevation. Some things are reperfusive in nature. So looking at clot rupture and platelet aggregation, it might represent something which is an occlusion, which is about 99% or somewhere around there. And you get reperfusion through that. That's why the pain goes away and you get reperfusion waves appearing. And this is all a spectrum and a dynamic spectrum. It's not always about the dichotomy of STEMI versus non-STEMI. What about this one? Does this interest you? Does this interest you to send a consult to your interventionist to get him interested? Might look like there's a problem here or here. One could argue that hmm, there might be depressions which are a cause for worry. Some of you might argue that this is a hyperacute T wave. So T wave which looks really, really large with a large area under the T wave compared to the QRS complex. One could argue also that there are elevations here. 
Does this go to the cath lab? Does this represent an occlusion which requires reperfusion? Once again, pattern recognition will lead you to think, yes, these are called the winter waves. So sagging ST segments with a large hyperacute T wave might have chest pain now, might have had chest pain earlier, but it's all representative of left main disease. Now, left main disease is worse than having occlusion in the LAD because your circumflex is involved as well. So remember this pattern, also named after a cardiologist. So Wellens was a cardiologist, unfortunately passed away this year. And De Winter was also a cardiologist. So associated with left main disease. What about this? Once again, suspicion or about ischemia here laterally and maybe high laterally, also inferiorly. If this patient had chest pain yesterday or one hour ago, doesn't matter. What would you do? Get a troponin? Call somebody? Aspirin? Neither. The answer is it's associated in terms of AVR with lots of trouble. So AVR is the most ignored lead on an ECG in general. ECGs um, used for toxicology or in terms of overdose, you might remember that a tall R wave in AVR provides you with evidence for sodium channel blockade. But in this case, in the context of chest pain, it's associated with left main disease. Also, by the way, right main disease. So remember, AVR elevations associated with depressions in other leads are not good. To be fair, the fourth universal definition in detail wise, if you read through it, does actually accept, and it is mentioned there, that AVR is a problem. It is a STEMI equivalent. It's not part of many algorithms, certainly not part of our activation criteria for lytics or PCI, but it is recognized. And there are a few other things that are recognized, but not put into straightforward algorithms. One of them are bundle branch block patterns. Now it is a puzzling thing when you look at it this way. Is this something which represents an occlusion? Now, I didn't know any of this until I read it on a blog, believe it or not, because I usually associate these two with syncope, and I call that bifascicular block. However, in the context of chest pain, this LAD lesion is actually a combination of a right bundle branch block shown here with left axis deviation. And 18 to 20% of these cases represent a critical stenosis in the LAD. So beware. And it is in the fine print. But other things are there too. We also have problems detecting occlusions in people who have complicated ECGs. If you have a pacemaker or if you have an existing bundle branch block, it can skew your ST segment. Those of you who might want to send this patient to the cath lab are correct indeed. You're applying something which is called a Scarbosa or a modified Scarbosa criterion. And you may need a help from a computer or MD calc to remember these things, but that's completely fine. A good way to remember it is that usually in a paced rhythm, things would point in an opposite direction after the pacer. But in this case, it's concordant. And this elevation after a paced rhythm is concordant. So inferior changes over here, there is a level of discordance, which is important too. And once again, if you can't remember these things, I'll point you towards a very good app, which you can use. Here's another ST segment elevation, which may or may not be a problem. This was actually two or three days ago. What's the problem here? The computer does say LVH criteria, and it's true. 
if you add on the S wave and the R waves, there is left ventricular hypertrophy. So are these elevations significant? Let's just say chest pain was over an hour ago. Does this patient have an occlusion? If you apply criteria, which are sometimes difficult to calculate, this patient does have a coefficient, adding all these values up, which was about 31. And this patient did have an LAD occlusion. And these calculators are free and available. These are the two better ones that I know of. Both are emergency physicians who published this. They are free once again. And technology like this should be used to help us, not hinder us. Do download these if you have a chance. And go to this site if you have a chance. All you have to do is put in OMI manifesto and it will lead you to another world. A world whereby there's a reformation taking place. And those of you who are proponents of history might notice the uh, reference to Martin Luther and uh, the ECG being pasted on the wall there. And it's a collaboration by, once again, well-known EM physicians in the world, and Stephen Smith, who's from Minnesota, and EM Crit um, is well-known to most of you for critical care. And they have come up with an alternative dichotomy instead of STEMI, non-STEMI, it's OMI or non-OMI. OMI referring to occlusion MI, whereby the current stratification by ECGs needs to be refined because it represents or misses occlusions in the cases that we've mentioned above. And there's quite a few other cases which are in this manifesto, which you might be interested to read up on. But I'll leave you to browse this website and this manifesto, as well as all the examples on their sites, to hopefully lead you to finding more occlusions. So what about that ECG? Now that we've gone through a little bit about how to find subtle occlusion signs, you might notice that there is elevation in ABR. Now it's not one millimeter, according to criteria, but there are other things which are worrying. Elevations here, reciprocation ischemia here. And indeed, my thought process these days was to call it an occlusion and ask the interventionist whether he was interested. Now be aware that you might find some resistance. Now, not so experienced cardiologists who are on call, trainees who are on call, um, and you might get some resistance even from experienced people, but it's no harm trying. And try we did. And this is what he had. So remember that AVR is associated with very proximal lesions, left or right, or in this terms, what I call utter badness, both proximal coronary arteries. So even a pre-hospital ECG can lead to a significant diagnosis, which changes the course of the patient's outcome and trajectory. So in conclusion, pattern recognition is not just for SD elevations. Add these things to your armamentarium. All it is, is reading, practicing, and enacting on the floor. Easy to say, but you have to do it. Think about occlusion. It's not just about elevations. Sometimes other aspects of the ECG benefit from reperfusion. There is no harm asking. And dichotomies can be changed. We can go from what was before to what is at the moment, maybe if the culture changes all around the world, introducing a new dichotomy or a new standard whereby all occlusions are treated the same. So I hope this helps in some ways. These are the contact points for myself. I'm happy to answer any questions when this ends and take care and we'll see you on the other side. Good luck treating your patients. Thank you for listening.